I'm getting started. Okay. Hi, my name is Wei. I work here at Shopee. I am active on Twitter on that uh, non-syllable handle on top of the corner. And we have a full talk today. <laughs> so uh, when I first proposed this topic to be spoken at ReactJS Meetup, I got the feedback that it might not be interesting to the audience. So I was very, really very worried. I checked the GitHub stars for flow versus TypeScript. And it's not, very, it's not a very good sign. And furthermore, I am seeing maybe 100 tweets about TypeScript until I see one about Flow. And it's likely that Flow published a new version. So last weekend at JSConf Asia, I put a capitalized Flow on my name tag there. And I was asking people around, like, hey, do you still use Flow? And from my very incomplete sample of developers I spoke to, people are still secretly using Flow. <laughs> they just don't talk about it. So today, let me beat that kid who says, I'm using Flow, I've been very confused, and here's how I got less confused. So last year before Christmas, when everything was slow, I was browsing through internal tasks, and here's a new ticket that said, upgrade Flow to 85. As a background, someone from our team has been keeping our code base up to date with Flow, so I never really bothered. And then, it was a month later, before Chinese New Year this time, and everything was slow again, I was browsing through internal tasks again, and guess what I see? That Flow ticket was still there. So now I'm curious. Um, there is a see no evil emoji there. So, I wonder, what's the evil there? So this very innocent, new, cute little kitty in one fine afternoon punched in the command to upgrade Flow, and guess what happened? An undisclosable number of unhappiness bursted out, right? I cannot tell you the exact number, um, but you can interpret yourself uh, by the number of digits there. So something big happened in 85, right? Um, the Flow team published a blog post along the release of 85, explaining the whys and hows behind. When I look back today, the whole article makes sense now, but maybe I was too stranger when it, uh, to begin with. So basically, um, I could not relate to what was actually happening uh, in our code base the first few times I read this article. So today, let me try to begin this talk by trying to relate to you what actually happened with my understanding now. Let's look at a simple function first. Can we see this? Okay. All right. Um, we want to look at how a function passes information here. This function takes a string of creature and returns a string that corresponds to the unicorn form of that creature. So cornifying a kitten gives you Kitten corn. Kitten corn is a thing here, okay? It's my companion today. So cornified kitten gets you a kitten corn, and cornifying pony gets you a unicorn. When we export the function uh, down below, Flow will ask us to annotate creature because exported function parameter is one of the input positions that is required to annotate. We don't have to annotate the return uh, type, but if we do, Flow is able to use that explicit information both inside and outside the function body. So anywhere that value of the function return is used is gonna have that type. Now let's migrate the same thinking to higher order components. Uh, Cornify now is a higher order component. It takes a creature component and instantiates it with a spiraling horn. Um, but what creature, are, uh, what creature are we quantifying? We don't know yet. Um, they're not as simple as strings. They're React components. So after flow 89, um, it provides us with a util that allows us to annotate abstractly uh, what the component is by supplying just the prop types as well as an instance. But we're not gonna worry about instance for today. And now as our higher order component quantify, should know the relation between the two components 
So Cornify should be responsible for deducing and passing the information around. But in order, to, in order for Cornify to know what the input of uh, what creature is, we need to tell Cornify what the props are. Right? We can pass that information as, uh, to Cornify by providing a type parameter next to the function definition here. Then uh, Cornify is now able to know uh, what the input component is. So it will just put it here. And notice that now we're actually not explicitly annotating the input and the output uh, at this moment. We're still we're making it implicit for now because we're still waiting for the user to provide um, an explicit annotation for the props. And notice also how inside uh, Cornify, the creature component is actually instantiated here in the return component. Therefore, if at any place we call Cornify without providing that props here, um, <coughs> at the ins instantiation step, we are, it is considered an implicit instantiation. Okay, let's move on. And what are the logic behind those props anyway? Uh, so here the props, uh, on the top, the props should contain the crown prop that the creature should be in. And at the return, top, uh, return component, on the other hand, uh, no longer needs crown because Cornify is feeding the crown. So uh, we want to take away uh, crown. And we do that by using the div utility, util provided by flow. And this void appended here is used to go around the potential problem where props may not have crown inside of it uh, to begin with. Okay, now, um, chances are Cornify, the higher order component, um, lives in its own file. And Unicorn, of course, is also going to have its own file. And then the, the future component that is going to instantiate the unicorns is going to live in yet another file. So the information about the types of those components will come in from a file dependency. Before 85, Flow did its type uh, inference walk before merging in the type information from dependency, and therefore it will actually lose those information. And after 85, Flow waits until the information from the dependency to be merged in, and then it will do its walk to complete the type inference. That is why uh, Flow is now able to um, catch more errors on those uh, inferred types. But there is a big performance cost to pay if Flow walks a long chain of dependencies to learn about props of components files away. So it asks that we explicitly annotate within each file's import export cycle. So so that now it will be it, it will be safe for Flow to assume that here, when it imports Unicorn and Kittencore, both of them are already explicitly annotated. This is also why, after 85, Flow will ask you to explicitly annotate each module exports within one file import export cycle. Is everybody still with me? <laughs> okay, okay, we're, we're now at a better part of the story, okay? So we already know that after 85, the code base exploded. And we also know that the higher order components participated in the explosion, right? So what in our code base are the most commonly used higher order components? It's the React Redux Connect. And we're not alone. Apparently, everybody's connected components were exploded. So back then, I had no clue how to fix this. Um, so why don't we just Google it? So I landed on this GitHub issue in Flow's repo, and I'm not sure if I like his words. I see desperate here, painful, complex, and outdated, those kind of things. But at least we're here, right? There's an issue someone already raised in Flow's GitHub repo. So why don't we see what other people say about it? Someone responded to it on the same day, and it goes like that. 
Have a look at the tests alongside the flow type li library definition. That's the best way to see up-to-date recommended practices. I mean, what do you mean the best way is to look at tests? Are there no docs? Anyway, um, if we think about it, it's actually not that outrageous, right? Because Flow is not supposed to know about React Redux, and React Redux is not supposed to know about Flow, neither. So what brings them together is this community-maintained Flow-typed library definition repo for Flow. Um, so after 85, the people at Flow type discussed new options for the library definitions and ultimately settled on a new solution um, <clears throat> for React Redux after V5 because V6 and 7 are uh, downward compatible and it's also dependent on Flow version past 89. So here is the signature for connect. And I'm blinded again. Apparently English is not a good language for abbreviations and <laughs> I believe the library author also agrees with that. So they actually provide a dictionary at the top of the file. So now we're able to reassemble like what Connect is, uh, is doing here. There are as many as six type parameters in Connect, um, but actually we don't need them um, all because Flow is able to infer some of them. And most of the time, you only need two. And the underscore is um, a placeholder in Flow that was added in version 84. I have a link to a commit that adds this underscore at the back, back on my slide. So if you're interested, you can read that after this. So React Redux recommends three ways for you to connect a component. They are connecting component with map status props, connecting component with map dispatch props, and connecting the component with both map state props and map dispatch props. It also recommends that map dispatch props is an object full of action creators. So, <clears throat> so we'll go with that as well. You might not be able to see this. I'm going to read this for you. So uh, own props uh, has passed through, which is the props that is not concerned with connect at all. Uh, but it's going to pass through uh, your connected component. And then we have four map state to props, uh, which will be the props that connect uh, consumes, uh, map state to props consumes. <coughs> and then uh, props will be own props plus the props that map state to props will feed in to your component. So you will be spreading own props here. And take note that when you spread a, an object with flow, they better be exact. And then when you annotate, is this line here, I'm sorry about the size, um, <clears throat> you connect with the first parameter being the props, and then the second, second parameter own props. You don't need the remaining four because flow will infer them. And then that's it. And where did I know about this? It's in the test file. Next one, uh, <clears throat> when connecting with just map dispatch props, uh, own props has only passed through because we're not using map state to props here. And then props will have own props plus the props fit in by this map dispatch to props. And once again, you put it here, props being the first parameter, own props being the second parameter. And where did I know about this? It's in the test. And then finally, uh, connecting with map dispatch to props and map state to props. Um, in props, you have own props plus dispatch props plus state props, and, and then uh, under connect, you put props in the first place and then own props in the second place, and where did I know about this? It's in the test file. So, um, <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> once we know how to annotate connect, we feel we're almost there, right? So every, everybody good with connect now? know where to look when you are stuck. All right. OK, he, here is the best part. Uh, our team love higher order components. Anybody knows an article called Higher Order Component in Depth on Medium three years ago? That one was on our onboarding guide. So this is our new product detail page. The whole page is wrapped with a higher order component that wraps your content with a header that has the search bar 
and the footer that will, uh, they will load the footer content based on which page you are in. And then this wrapper actually is wrapped around with another high order component that takes care of theming so that the page will change theme on the festival season. Um, every single component here is wrapped around with tracking and error boundary. And then finally, this whole big chunk of recommendation here, each of those are wrapped around with a higher order component where you can feed in just the item ID and the type of ref, uh, recommendations you need, and it will feed in uh, all the items you need here. We love high order components so much that we even still compose from Redux and use it on our components. We thought we were pretty smart. Well, wait until we have to annotate this. So let's start. Um, no, so a component with everything will have all props. Um, we will pass that information to the nearest high order component, which will be with C. So with C uh, receives all props, and because with D is responsible for feeding in D, it's gonna take away D, uh, what it returns. So uh, what we feed into the next tower component we see is not going to have D in it. So we do that by taking the div of all props with, with D props. We're just going to assume that with D props is correct. And then we're going to, the next tower component that's going to, um, we're going to feed in with the props information with is with B. And once again, we'll take away the with C props and so on and so forth. Chances are we're not done yet because most of the time we'll still have connects. And I'm like, if you were in my situation like three months ago, had some hundreds of components like that to fix, not to mention that you're not even 100% sure that all of these higher order components are correctly annotated. Will you go ahead and do everything like this? Um, so for the longest time, I was really stuck and not knowing what to do. Um, I did some searches for it, but they were ver really very echoless. This time, there's, no, there's not even a GitHub issue. It was just nothing. I checked the test file, too. Uh, you can check it later. <clears throat> but the complexity doesn't match. And then in this test file, uh, it's not really what I, um, they're also annotating the high order component inside. So that's actually not really what I wanted to do. So we started to question whether higher order component is still a pattern we want or not. And as a matter of fact, that was the time we were urged to consider adapting to hooks so we can peel off higher order component wrapping. And so we actually upgraded our React dependency to 16.8 during that time. But still, it is really very unrealistic for us to rewrite all the hooks at once just to make Flow happy. So uh, we're still here. Still stuck, but um, <clears throat> my philosophy of life is just that if one blocking problem will eventually unblock itself if you stay uh, long enough with it. So one day, it all of a sudden occurred to me, like, why, why is it that I was trying to annotate higher order component layer by layer? I think it's probably the angle brackets because it, they're so inviting that they kept making me wanting to put stuff in it. So I went back to reading this article, the one Flow published alongside 85. It's a very long article, and when it introduced implicit instantiation errors, it said that you can either annotate with explicit type argument, which what we did just a while ago, or you can annotate the return type. Okay, so that's hint number one. And hint number two, somewhere else in this article, and said that sometimes annotating the return value will be simpler. And that we only have to annotate once within import one import-export cycle. So um, that was like the aha moment. It's like, is everybody uh, ready to see the final puzzle resolved? Um, so we won't be doing subtraction anymore we'll be doing addition. We start at own props, which contains no injected props. And once again, we prefer to explicitly annotate our props, so we merge all our props uh, to be used in the definition of the component. So here, we use all props. But when we export, we do not annotate those higher order components 
layer by layer. Instead, we just say all at once that uh, the return, the exported component is uh, on props. So in this way, we don't have to worry about all the higher order components wrapping at all, and the component is correctly annotated, it has everything, and then outside of this con component, you only have to worry about own props, which is the intended way uh, we want this component to pass the information around. And in fact, you won't lose any coverage by annotating the final export this way, because even if you do annotate with explicit type parameters in the middle, each of those is only going to compute uh, what it returns, and we are going to pass that information down to the next layer, which is not really required. Okay. That's when we start moving again. Isn't that amazing? Um, <clears throat> but wait, there's more. Um, I'm sorry to tell you that if, like, if I leave you with the impression that everything is about how higher order components only, this talk will not be complete. So there are some other issues that we run into. Like from 85, it was the first time we actually put in function type parameters in the beginning. But Prettier refused to pick up that syntax and not recognize them as flow type annotations, but instead recognize them as expressions. So every time I save the file, it would change the file to like that. Um, and it will uh, format them wrongly and it also block our CI. So you spend the next half a day trying to understand completely unrelated issues like uh, what is the difference between Prettier Yeslin, Yeslin plugin Prettier, and Yeslin config Prettier. Turned out that our Prettier was more than a major version away and there was a bug that was fixed in a recent version. So upgrade your Prettier. Um, there's more. Uh, back then, Flow was using a lot of memory, and sometimes if I was accidentally running two copies of uh, Flow servers, this 16 gig memory machine will shout at me and be like, hey, your machine is out of memory, and started randomly executing applications. That was just super scary. Um, I'm not sure if this will work. There is even more. Sorry, no, sound, no audio, sorry. You can enjoy that at home. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the final, like, uh, this, this uh, okay, why is it blank? Anyway, I was really very inexperienced to begin with. For example, I did not know what was going on when, say, I fixed one in implicit instantiation errors. Um, I would expect the total number of errors to be go down by one, right? Well, sometimes. Some other times, it will go up by like tens. And I could not see the newly generated errors because my console maxed out at like 4,000 lines of output. So those newly generated errors, I have no idea where to find those. And when the total number of errors bloated up by one digit, I thought I was clearly doing something wrong and I reverted all my previous changes. That was just a complete waste of time. It was only after I cleared all the other errors when I finally saw that the new errors were the errors Flow was able to catch after I explicitly annotated my uh, components. Um, so here's what I learned. Uh, fix the groups of errors together. Um, maybe it's a time to review some bash commands uh, at this time. So when I fixed our second package, uh, and I knew like, what I was doing. Um, <clears throat> what, uh, what you want to do is you want to fix all the implicit instantia instantia instantiation errors first. Uh, your number of errors will likely go up. Don't worry about that. Uh, fix other errors also in groups. Uh, they, normally, they will have some identical, I identifiable phrases so that you can do something similar. And then um, when you clear everything else, the newly generated errors will come together with very accurate error messages, so they will be very quick to fix. So in the second package that I worked on, also some big three-digit number of errors, knowing what was going on and knowing what I was, uh, what I was doing, uh, it is actually possible to fix them within just half a day with only four commits. 
So our CI finally passed after three months, and it was really very <coughs> therapeutic. And you can do it too. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so there were a few questions that we asked along the way. Is it worth the effort? Um, in April this year, the Flow team published an official blog post, official blog post, that aimed at helping people upgrade their Flow code base. The secret is, when they upgrade, they have an they have an internal tool that will automatically suppress all new errors caused by the upgrade. If I knew about this right in like January, I would just do that, and there would not be this talk. But if we uh, flow fix me everything, we're actually losing the improved coverage uh, on that version. And in fact, the improved type safety is actually a crucial gain. After this upgrade, Flow is able to notice the errors when the props uh, wrapped with higher order components uh, don't match, even if you might be crossing file boundaries. And it also provides more accurate error messages that will pinpoint you to which files are reporting the conflicting types. I believe this question has its ground. <laughs> Since the Flow team themselves has also written that um, <clears throat> recently a bunch of open source projects are uh, migrating to TypeScript. This first sentence in this quote, sorry, uh, I need to, sorry, okay. So this first sentence in this quote is the highlight of that post, the, like the most popular highlight of that post. But I think we should not take that line out of context. Um, it does sound to me uh, that the people on the other faction are having a better life, maybe with better community support. Um, <clears throat> although I think a better question to ask is this. Uh, will switching to TypeScript solve our problems? I think keeping our code base up to date uh, with Flow ever since 85. As we speak today, we're at uh, 101. Throughout this process, I've encountered problems over and over, and I soon realized that my, that my previous understanding about the type system was really very shallow. So um, behind all of this, the bigger picture is um, Flow, as well as TypeScript, is a type system or a static type, uh, static type checker on top of a dynamic language. So whenever I encountered a problem, a closest friend to ask was just TypeScript. Is this problem specific to Flow? Or is this specific to our implementation? Or is it a battle between flexibility and type safety? Or is it about the dynamic nature of JavaScript? Consider this example. This is a function that takes a number or a string and may return a number or a string. If you try to use that function, plug in a string, and expect uh, the type system to know that fx, when we give it the value, to know that it is a string, it won't. We may have multiple function call signatures, but it is not possible to write overloaded function bodies with JavaScript. So the code below will always result in a type error. However, like, it doesn't matter if you are with Flow or TypeScript, you're always going to have this error. Um, therefore, it is probably not wise to switch faction before understanding what is causing the hair pulling. You might, <clears throat> you might end up putting all the effort to uh, learn the other syntax, only to realize that you're facing the same issue. And by the way, this uh, repo here compares the differences between Flow and TypeScript. So if you're really seriously considering switching over, check this out first. Um, and in fact, Throughout the past few versions after 85 that I've been keeping our uh, code base up to date with, Flow has become better and better at each releases. They've been focusing on performance, reliability, and language tooling. So a selection of such improvements includes uh, making Flow recheck only what needs to be rechecked when a file changes. They built a feature that creates a saved state per commit. That, um, so that your flow server can start on the previous commit state. They also re-architected major parts of flow for better responsiveness for uh, IDE integration or intelligence. It is now using less memory, and there are more and better utility types around React. So instead of thinking 
of this um, as an either or. I prefer to think of them in a both uh, mindset. They're both static type checker on top of our dynamic JavaScript. They can both be considered as a compiler. They have some differences, one relying more on type inference like flow, the other one being more verbose. I say try them both on different projects and use them as a stepping stone to understanding type systems better. Because it will lead us to think about this next question, um, is if something is very difficult to annotate, does it indicate a bad practice in implementation? And let me throw in just two more final code snippet, I promise, okay. Um, as we discussed earlier about, all we discussed earlier about higher order components, they're not hard, they're not difficult. They're, the, the difficulty was more on the lack of guidance, uh, rather the actual problem, um, <clears throat> the actual problem uh, is actually not hard. This is hard. Why? There, this is a function that it may return either a string or a location shape. If you still remember the example two slides ago, it is not possible for you to um, know from the function call that what's returned is going to absolutely going to become a string. So whatever this type is, is either a string or a location shape, it's going to be passed into whatever that uses this function value. And there's no way you can refine that on that spot. So you will, you will have to keep writing that uh, if-else uh, if condition uh, if you're writing your function, like the very base function, this way. Um, <clears throat> so maybe here we'll consider, instead of having a very smart function that returns the either-or thing, we have two separate functions, and we call them at uh, two different uh, conditions that we can control. And this is hard. This is a function that takes a parameter of a type that's either that type or is a generator of that type. Um, and you would expect that type of function, type of function, uh, type of unicorn equals to function to land you on the generator branch. It won't because it doesn't know whether this one is a function or not. So this is hard. Um, I would. I would prefer to think of this as a chance. Well, I don't think the conclusion is whenever the typing is hard, the implementation is bad. No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying here is when it is really hard for you to type, think about whether we're actually doing <coughs> a bad implementation or not. So this final question I propose is that we think about this. We initially brought in type system on top of JavaScript to gain type safety. But when our type system is unhappy, we take that as a chance to think whether our implementation is a good practice or not. So this is all I will sh be sharing as a content today. I have a long list of references, uh, so allow me to navigate you through a little bit. <laughs> I have many guides. The ones with an avatar are by myself. I have two. Uh, guides on essentially the same topic, but they were written in different times. And the second one uh, on top, I believe is a better one, but uh, I know the second one is correct. Um, and then I've been keeping our code base up to date with flow, so I have notes on 98, 99, and 100. I'm still working on 101. And then there are more um, <coughs> uh, migration guides by other people. I've checked all of those. All of those are saying the right thing. Um, <coughs> there are a few GitHub. Um, pages, GitHub issues and commits that are quite interesting for you to read. And then finally, maybe you should re-ask King for required annotations one more time, see if it makes more sense. And then Flow has a resources page um, <clears throat> that if you are interested in type system, you can take a look at that as well. The URL to this slice, flowbehappy at .net, okay? And um, I want to save time for our next two talks, so there will be no uh, question and answering session, but feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or uh, speak with me offline. Thank you.